afternoon students and welcome to today's lecture on sport in Homeric Greece. A little time we like to call the Age of Heroes. I of course am your professor Dr. Rob Steffen and today we're going to dive into the Homeric epics. That's right, the Iliad and the Odyssey to see what they can tell us about sport during the Dark Ages and the early part of the Archaic period in Greece. Now this will of course be partially about the sports themselves. And ooh boy, do we get sports today, right? Chariot races, foot races, boxing, fighting, uh, fighting each other with spears, for goodness sake. Uh, but it's also gonna be about the role and function that these sports played within Homeric society. Now, as we go through this lecture, we'll see that these sports are kind of intimately tied to other aspects of Greek culture. So things like religion and warfare and politics. That is right, sport just got real. Really important, that is. So whether you've got a grudge against the Trojans or you're just trying to make your way back to see your honey, journey with me as we investigate sport in the age of heroes. Now, before we get into the sports themselves, it's important to set the stage here, right? So up until now, we've been talking about the Bronze Age. So the period from about 3000 BCE to about 1200 BCE. And that time period we tend to associate with increasing complexity, right? Increasing social complexity. And it's a time that we sometimes even call the rise of civilization because of that increasing complexity. Well. I hate to say it, but all good things come to an end. And in the Mediterranean, uh, that all happens in one giant collapse. I mean, there is destruction everywhere right around 1200 BCE. And this launches Greece into a period that we call the Dark Ages. So things like palaces disappear, trade networks break down, settlements get smaller, burials get poorer, people forget how to write for the love of Zeus. Things got bad. And then all of a sudden, right around 800 BCE, the proverbial light dawns. So populations start to grow. The Greeks set sail from their homeland to found colonies around the Mediterranean. The Olympics begin and art regains a level of sophistication not seen for half a millennium. Now, perhaps most importantly, the Greeks reinvent writing, right? They had forgotten how to do it for 400 years. It is now back. And scholars think that the language itself is still similar to what the Greeks were speaking back in the Bronze Age, right? That is the Bronze Age and Dark Age and Archaic Greeks, they were all speaking Greek. But the manner in which they write is now totally different. Instead of using a syllabic script, right, in pictograms like they would have done in the Bronze Age, the Greeks now have a full-fledged alphabet, right? Very kindly borrowed from the Phoenicians and it consists of 24 characters, complete with both consonants and vowels. Now, this might not sound like a very big deal, but ooh boy, it was. So having an alphabet rather than something like pictograms, it has a very big implication here. It means you can now use writing to document almost any sound that a person can make. So now instead of simple administrative records, right, that we got in the Bronze Age, 
The Greeks now, in the early archaic period, they are writing down epic poems. So take a look at this. It's called the Cup of Nestor over here, right? And although it looks like a piddly little ceramic vessel, it's incredibly important historically. It is the world's earliest inscription in that Greek alphabet. And here's how it translates. It says, Nestor's cup, good to drink from. Whoever drinks from this cup, him straight away, the desire of beautiful crowned Aphrodite will seize. Now, if you've never heard of Nestor's cup, this is actually a reference to a massive golden chalice held by the king of Pelos, a guy by the name, of course, of Nestor. And he joined the Greeks in the assault of Troy during the Trojan War. Now, by referencing this on this kind of tiny little ceramic cup, it actually seems to be sort of a joke that even though this is indeed a little crappy, crappy ceramic cup, uh, it'll still have the powers of Nestor's golden cup and make Aphrodite, right, the goddess of love. And perhaps maybe all women in general fall in love with you. Now, I guess if you drink enough wine out of that cup, maybe you'll actually begin to believe that. Either way, right, we get an interesting reference both to the story of the Trojan War, which must have already been in place when this thing was, was written, right, as well as the very first Greek inscri inscription, a very, very important artifact here. Anyway, Nestor's Cup isn't all about sports, but the reference to Homer's Iliad does leave us in a good place. So you see, if the inscription referencing Nestor's Cup comes from around 740 BCE, then people must have already been aware of the Greek epics, things like the Iliad, so that they would understand the reference. Otherwise, why would you have the reference at all, right? You can't really reference something that hasn't been composed yet. And this would mean that Homer's works were very likely written uh, sometime in the first or second half of, you know, sometime during the 8th century BC, giving us a very, very rough date for Homer, if indeed he was a real person. Now, eventually, this all coalesced into a single coherent story sometime in that 8th century BCE. But this is somewhat problematic because the Trojan War itself, right, the main topic of the Iliad, if that Trojan War was a real thing, it very likely did not happen in the 8th century. Instead, it happened 400 years earlier, likely as part of the Bronze Age collapse, sometime between 1200 and 1100 BCE, meaning that the epic poems of Homer were probably composed about 400 years after the Trojan War itself. Now, in case this is your first class on ancient Greece, the Trojan War is the name that we give to that epic battle between the Greeks, led by the city-states like Mycenae and Tiryns and Pylos, and the Trojans who inhabited the city of Troy on the west coast of what is modern-day Turkey. Now, the Iliad itself starts nine years into a 10-year-long war, right? So we're already pretty far into the war once the story begins. And it begins uh, when Paris, the prince of Troy, kidnaps Helen, right, the wife of King Menelaus of, uh, of Sparta. So the Greeks are in a bind because Achilles has decided to sit out the war. He's really, really upset at the Greek king Agamemnon, who's taken his woman. And as a result of Achilles' absence, the Greeks are just getting their butts whooped on the battlefield. Now, they're losing so bad that Achilles' best friend, a guy by the name of Patroclus, decides to borrow the armor of Achilles, right? Dress himself up to look like Achilles, and then head into battle. And when the other Greeks see Patroclus in this armor, they think Achilles has indeed joined the fight. He's fighting with a, a speed and a ferocity that just hasn't been seen before, and they get a renewed sense of energy and optimism. Now, Patroclus is fighting like a boss, but eventually, after slaying loads of Trojans, he is eventually struck down and killed by Hector, another one of these princes of Troy. Now, Patroclus' death prompts Achilles to join the battle, eventually defeating Hector and giving the Greeks the upper hand in the war. But before Achilles jumps into the fray, right, he puts on a series of funeral games in honor of his beloved Patroclus. And it's these funeral games where we see Homeric sport most clearly. All right, so to understand what's up with these funeral games, it's necessary to understand some of the values at play in Homer, right? 
Now, Homer was writing, or more accurately, he was probably singing for an aristocratic audience in the 8th century BCE in Greece. And so the values that he extols in those poems and songs in the Iliad, right, were likely the very same values that his audience held dear. So things like the love of competition, like piety towards the gods, and a strict hierarchical social order where those in charge should be respected and stay in charge, right? So he was writing for an aristocratic audience, performing for them, uh, and extolling the values they held dear to keep them in power. Now, two of these specific values are known by the Greek words agathos and arete. Now, the word agathos translates roughly as being a good man. And the way that Homer says that you become a good man is by being the best, right? Better than all the rest. And the way that you get to be the best is through exhibiting, that's right, arete, or excellence. Now, most of the time that you demonstrate your arete, it's on the battlefield. But sports gives men another arena through which to show off their arete in an attempt to become an agathos. So now all of a sudden we have a non-deadly way that you can gain arete and become an agathos, not just by doing it in kind of deadly warfare. So as we go through the funeral games of Patroclus, right, realize that the competitors, they're not just vying for prizes or riches, but they're also vying for preeminence in status amongst each other. Now that's not to say there weren't prizes though, right? In unlike sport during the Bronze Age, where kings often put on athletic displays to show their own strength and power, Homeric sport, it was a competitive venture and the winners did indeed get to take home something. So common prizes were things like giant bronze tripods, right? Which were large cauldrons on three legs. And amphoras, which were ceramic storage vessels. And they were frequently filled with wine or olive oil and often richly decorated. And these prizes, they actually serve two functions here. So not only do the winners get to take something home that's valuable after a victorious event, they also gave the host of the games kind of an opportunity to display his wealth to his peers. And we can see that kind of showing off of wealth in the games Achilles hosts in honor of his buddy Patroclus. So Achilles isn't just doing this out of the goodwill of his heart, right? He's also gaining status amongst his peers by showing off his wealth. And to some extent, he may be trying to make up for the fact that he's caused all these problems by refusing to fight earlier in the war. So Homeric sport uh, gives us our first mention of spectators as well. And we can see in Homer's description that the spectators of the ancient games, well, they reacted in much the same way as spectators in modern sport, right? They're applauding the victors. They're staring in awe at some of the amazing athletic feats. And they're scared during combat sports when it looks like somebody's gonna be gravely injured. And they laugh and they boo when somebody underperforms in a given event. Right? Don't, don't come up short or you're going to get mocked by those spectators. Now go to any football game today and it's likely that you'll experience the same range of responses from the crowd. Right? Applause, amazement, boos, fear of injury, <laughs> more boos if your team's losing. That sort of thing. Right? It really isn't all that different from the spectator perspective, even though we're talking about this 3,000 years ago. Okay, so we've mentioned the funeral games of Patroclus a few times already, and now it's time to take a deep dive into those games. So remember that Patroclus was Achilles' best friend, and quite possibly his lover, and it's the death of Patroclus that prompts Achilles to re-enter the Trojan War. And by reading Homer's account of these games, we can get a sense for how games were set up during Homer's time more generally since it's likely that his literary description kind of mimicked the way that this worked in the real world at that time. And what we learn from this is that the earliest games needed very little in terms of setup. The kind of only requirement here is that there was somebody who was willing to put up a set of prizes for the victors in the events. We'll see that later on with things like the Olympics, oaths and processions and sacrifices and all sorts of other things become necessary to get the games underway. But back in these earliest days, well, you just needed somebody to be willing to donate a bronze tripod or a few amphoras of olive oil and boom, you were set and ready to go. Now, like we mentioned earlier, right, the funeral games that Achilles puts on for Patroclus not only served to honor his dead friend, 
but also to give Achilles kind of chance to give back some of his wealth to other aristocratic friends, right? Kind of like an apology for not fighting earlier in the war. And sporting events could be used as a way, right, kind of in this way, for aristocrats then to kind of build these important social connections and bonds through what is essentially gift giving, right? Sports could be a way to redistribute wealth and to gift give. And finally, in terms of who gets to participate here, we get somewhat of a disconnect between what's said and what actually occurs. So Achilles calls forth anyone who wants to challenge him, right? Anybody's able to participate. So perhaps anybody actually could get invited. But in reality, it's only the princely aristocrats, right? The best of the best who do well in these competitions. So the commoners in this story, at least, get destroyed quickly and badly. And from what we can imagine of sport in the 8th century BCE, it largely was the domain of aristocratic elite men. Now, the first event mentioned in Homer's description of the funeral games of Patroclus is the two-horse chariot race. Now, in addition to being the first, it's also the longest description, and it has the best prizes. So everything from a skilled woman to a large tripod, to a pregnant mare, to a big lump of gold. All these as prizes for the two-horse chariot race. And it also has the biggest number of competitors, with five different people trying to win. And through the description, we can see that some of these aristocratic values, uh, what they were and how they were espoused. So for example, one of the younger charioteers is chastised for not yielding to one of the older opponents, right? And it's not hard to see how this is a kind of larger life lesson that young men in the 8th century BCE in Greece, they should obey their elders in life more generally. Now, Homer also portrays spectators as betting on the race. So we've got horse betting, right, all the way back 3,000 years ago, and even has competitors arguing about which chariot indeed won the race. Again, watch a boxing or an MMA fight uh, that goes the distance and you'll see that same kind of debate arise about who actually won. That sort of thing has not dwindled over time. After the chariot races, we get two combat sports that we still have today, right? Both boxing and wrestling. Now in boxing, just like today, we see the combatants wrap their hands, right? Wrap them up with a cloth or, or leather. Unlike what you might think though, this wasn't really the same idea as boxing gloves. It wasn't to protect the person getting punched. Rather, these kind of wraps, they were to help you not break your knuckles when you're bashing someone else's face in. Now, during the wrestling event, we see that Odysseus, right? The Odysseus ends up fighting Ajax, one of the strongest of all the Greek fighters. And Achilles actually stops this fight before the conclusion because it got too heated and it looked like somebody was going to get seriously hurt. Perhaps again, suggesting that the distribution of prizes and the bonds built in distributing those prizes is actually more important than having one definitive winner. Next up, we got the foot races. And later on, this actually becomes the very first event at the Olympics. But in this race, however, we see that age relationships, young and old, come into play once again. Now, at the beginning, people are giving old ass Odysseus a hard time because he's so old. They're like, oh man, Odysseus, you are never going to win this thing. You are way too old and slow. But Odysseus eventually does win. And finally, right, one of the young men concedes that only the Greeks, right, um, who could beat, the only Greek who could beat Odysseus was the swift-footed Achilles himself. Now, not only does this reinforce the idea that you should respect your elders, a kind of core value of uh, Dark Age and Archaic Greece, but it also makes Achilles so happy that he rewards this man monetarily for his own brown-nosing compliment. <laughs> so the, just because the guy says, oh man, you're so fast, the only person who could beat you was Achilles, he gets a prize just for saying that. <laughs> I guess it pays to compliment the guy putting on the games. Next up, we have got the weight throw. And this is one of my own personal favorites. Not because I could throw this a country mile, but because the main object in the event was also the prize. Now, competitors would uh, kind of pick up a big lump of iron, right? And they would chuck this lump of iron as far as they could. The winner then, as a prize, got that giant piece of iron that they threw in the first place. And this is really cool because it also gives you a sense of the disconnect between Homer's world 
and the world of the Bronze Age. Many times when he's writing, he's trying to set things back in the Bronze Age, but the main metal used in the Bronze Age was obviously bronze. But here we have a mention of iron, which hadn't been developed yet in that kind of Bronze Age that he's trying to set a lot of his action in. Okay, so these are the types of clues that historians use to figure out when these ancient stories were composed, right? The idea of this kind of bronze, or sorry, this kind of iron making an appearance. And if you remember back to the earliest inscription about Nestor's cup, you'll recall that it dates to around 740 BCE, meaning that the Homeric epics must predate that date, right? And now we have evidence that the Homeric epics must also post-date the development of iron. So we can now start to narrow it down, right? We know that it's after the development of iron, but it's before about 740, 720 BCE, and that's why we place the development of these Homeric epics sometime in the 8th century BCE. Now finally, to end this thing, we've got three different types of combat sports. The first being the so-called combat in arms. And this was actually quite dangerous. So combatants fought with weapons, right? But the goal was not to kill each other here, right? These are aristocratic men doing this, right? It's not like it's slaves or, or uh, you know, servants or something like that fighting on behalf of these aristocrats. It's the aristocratic men themselves. And the combatants fought with weapons. Uh, and the goal of this thing was to draw first blood, right? And you can imagine how serious uh, of an injury could occur because the line between drawing first blood and actually seriously injuring your opponent could be a pretty fine and narrow line, right? Now, during the funeral games of Patroclus, Achilles actually has to step in during this event and shut the whole thing down so it didn't get out of hand. Now, after the combat in arms, we've got archery and the spear throw, two kind of skill-based competitions. And we can see here that with the combat in arms and archery and spear throw, that it's some of the sporting events that they don't just give competitors kind of an opportunity to demonstrate their arete. These things are actually a proxy for warfare and they provide an opportunity to both train for battle, right? Improve your archery and spear throwing skills, as well as demonstrate one's skill in battle without ever having to be in battle in the first place. A really major development on that front. Okay, now let's shift from the Iliad, where we see sport as a proxy for warfare, to the Odyssey, where we see sport as a proxy for diplomacy. Now the Odyssey itself tells the story of Odysseus, right, one of the Greek leaders of the Trojan War, trying to make his way back home to his wife Penelope on the island of Ithaca. Now needless to say, that along the way, he went through a series of trials and tribulations. This was no yacht sailing through the Mediterranean, right? And during those adventures, Odysseus lands on the island of Phaeca, where he's hosted by the local king Alcinous, who puts on a series of games, right, to welcome his guest and to entertain him. And so once again, we see this shift in sport from a proxy from war, right, to a proxy for diplomacy. The king is putting on games to welcome his new guest into his court. So when Odysseus is brought into the court of King Alcinous, the king decides to entertain his guests with a series of games, right? And some of these, like boxing and wrestling, right, and running, they're quite, quite similar to what we see in the Iliad in the funeral games of Patroclus. But other events, like jumping, they're totally new. Those didn't occur in the funeral games of Patroclus. Now, the context is completely different as well. No longer is it a set of funeral games, right? But rather, it's a celebration of a visitor. And while there aren't prizes like there are in the funeral games, we do get the same set of aristocratic values espoused, right? So King Alcinous is basically trying to bait uh, Odysseus into participating by questioning his manhood. Odysseus at first doesn't want to play, and Alcinous is like, come on, right? If you're a real man, you'll participate. And this actually does the trick, right? Odysseus is convinced he does participate, and he totally dominates right? Making him uh, show like, you know, King Alcinous, how real kings ball out. <laughs> nice job there, Odysseus. Anyway, the climax of the Odyssey also brings competition to the forefront. And when uh, Odysseus finally makes his way back to Ithaca, he sees his wife Penelope besieged by suitors trying to win her hand in marriage. Now he himself, he's dressed like a beggar, 
but clever Odysseus devises a contest to determine who is worthy of Penelope. So his plan is an archery competition. Whoever can string his bow and shoot an arrow through a series of axe handles, they are the only ones worthy, right? Truly worthy of Penelope. Now all the suitors try and none have the strength to actually string the bow of Odysseus. But then the, the beggar looking person, Odysseus, right? He gets up there, he's able to string his bow easily and he easily shoots this ax or shoots this arrow through the series of ax handles. Then he ditches his beggar's robes, shows the shoot suitors what's up, and along with his son, ends up killing all the potential suitors. Kind of a harsh penalty for losing there. But once again, right, it's interesting that such a huge part of the story is based around athletic, skill-based competition. All right, so for our past meets present today, we're gonna to take a modern look at the linkages between sport on the one hand and politics, right? And we just saw that in Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus engaged in sport as a means of diplomatic relations with King Alcinous on the island of Phaeca. Well, that's not the last time in history sport would be used in such a way. Let's fast forward to the 20th century uh, in America, right? And this time we're not talking about foot races. We're not talking about boxing. We're not talking about chariot racing. We're talking about the mighty sport, that's right, of ping pong. A personal favorite of mine. Anyway, uh, in the 1970s, ping pong brought together the nations of China and the United States in a way that hadn't happened in decades. So it all begins in the aftermath of the Korean War in the 1950s. So the U.S. saw China as the aggressor in that and a promoter of communism. And as a result, they refused to have any sort of economic relations with China. And for decades, not only would the U.S. not engage economically with China, there was really no interaction whatsoever. Americans were essentially not allowed in China for any reason whatsoever there. Now, in 1971, Richard Nixon, that's right, Tricky Dick, was president of the United States, and the ping pong team was in Japan for the world championships, right, right next door. Now, during that time, China invited over the team uh, to the mainland to visit the Great Wall, to go visit the ballet, and to participate in a friendly game of ping pong against their national team. Now, American ping pongers commented on the friendships that they made with their Chinese counterparts. And later they commented, um, or later that year, the economic embargo against the Chinese was lifted, right? The following year, the Chinese team was invited to play in the United States to play some friendly matches. And the, uh, they actually participated against the University of Maryland's ping pong team. And by the end of 1972, Nixon had issued the Shanghai communique, stating that both nations would work productively together to resume normal relationships with one another. And this all happened, right, because China invited over the ping pong team for a friendly match after the world championships in Japan. So you don't have to be Odysseus to make political inroads, right? Just grab your paddle and engage with what we now call ping pong diplomacy. So let's reflect for a second on the difference we see in the context of sports so far. So sport in the Bronze Age was mainly the domain of kings, right? A way to show off their wealth and power and authority to rule over their people. But in the Homeric world, this context shifts dramatically. Now we see the funerary realm, right, as a, a place of sport to honor the dead. And rather than set people doing some sort of performance, right, we now have a larger group of people actually competing for victory with rules and prizes and spectators. We also see sport in a diplomatic context, where it's less about winning and more about sharing of culture with foreigners and with guests, right? So overall, it seems safe to say that with Homer, we enter the realm of kind of unequivocal, right, unambiguous sport in athletic competition with rules and with winners and with prizes and with spectators. And as we move on, we'll see how this evolves into standard athletic showcases like the Olympics and like the Panhellenic Games and like civic athletics as well. So next time you're out practicing, keep in mind that this isn't just to improve your athletic skills. You're becoming a better warrior and a better diplomat. Just a couple lessons you can learn from Sport in the Age of Heroes.